Okay, well, here we go, Beyond Belief. And I'll just get right into it. October 26th, I think it's interesting. I, well, I always say interesting. I think it's, well, let's just get into it. October 26th. We share experience, strength, and hope with each other. What we don't do and should not do is to share one another's burdens, whether financial or emotional. One day at a time in Al-Anon. Quote, live and let live, end quote, is harder when we perceive that a loved one is suffering. The Al-Anon program teaches loving detachment. We carry the message, not the body. For one thing, we may deprive others of the enriching firsthand lessons of self-reliance if we hastily jump to alleviate their plights. The rescuer role looks and feels noble, but not only might we cripple others by making life too easy for them, getting absorbed into another life might be a codependent means of avoiding our own things to do list. Oh yes, I meant to get my taxes done, but I've been busy rescuing hurricane victims. There are those two who are hard to love. Sometimes people who need love the most deserve it the least. Developing healthy boundaries is a process that takes practice and requires adjustment as we go along. Raising kids is about protecting and preparing we gradually increase freedoms within limits with children. Fellow members are not peers, not our kids. So let's remember that smother love is not being a good friend or parent. Controlling or fostering dependence meets our needs, not the needs of others. Am I overly invested in some of my relationships? Do I find some relationships in my life burdensome? Do I feel that other people's needs come before my own? Do I feel indispensable to anyone? Okay, so this was a hard one for me because I, I'm i a mom, right? So, and I'm raising children and I, you always feel codependent. I mean, I'm always helping, I'm always trying to, and then, and then at the same time, not trying to, trying to make sure that I let them you know, learn things on their own. So like I said, I have 11 and, and 15. So it's hard, you know, that balance that you have to have when you're a parent there, that's that. So I think that I will feel codependent <laughs> until th they've reached a certain age, right? And then you just let them go and you shut your mouth. Now the shut your mouth deal for me, is going to be hard because I real I just sat down on the couch today and I told them, I said, <laughs> it was so easy when they were little because they didn't have their, their own opinions. They didn't have opinions and you just told them, okay, you go get this on, you put this on, you know, this is what you wear and you get the pigtails and the, cute little bubblies and you put it in their hair and and then everybody goes out no one questions what they're wearing no one has an opinion about what was on television you just told them to turn it off because that wasn't appropriate for you or what you thought was appropriate so now you know letting them decide certain things yeah opinions they have opinions and that is hard that's hard so even letting them have their own opinions about certain things, even if it looks like it could be a destructive one, is hard to, to just not say something as a parent. Okay, my crappy childhood fairy. I looked up codependence. I had looked at her videos and that's how I got to really making an effort to go to al meetings. And uh, there's a couple things that uh, I'll put the two that I liked. One was codependency and the other one was, are you, are you controlling? Now I definitely have a controlling issue. I just ask my husband. So, you know, I'm, this is, these are the controlling behaviors. Okay. So I'll read them off to you. Outsourcing responsibility. She kind of broke it down a lot easier for me to understand. 
outsourcing responsibility, excessive offended, excessive and offended easily. They explain to you how sensitive they are and the rules that you have of the things that you can say, otherwise it'll trigger them. Um, and inviting certain people to events, like you can't invite this person because it, she bothers. There's foods, right? You can't, I can't eat this. You can't eat this. It's not good. I mean, that kind of person. You can't eat this. It's not good for me. Oh no, I can't eat that. That type of thing. Um, concerning shame. So, oh, I'm concerned about you. So it's a passive aggressive type of deal. Avoiding schedules. So never making, never always delaying something, never being on time. Silent treatment, that I have a problem with. I mean, that I have to always work on. Sleep deprivation or going to sleep, sleep when you are planning something and everybody's getting ready to go, but you have to go and take a nap and then they don't get to go where they need to be or they don't get to have fun. Emotional penalty by controlling your mood. So you get an emotional penalty because you're, you know, you're not, they're trying to control you. Um, the control expectations. Okay. So she explained that she had a friend and she wasn't, she was crying. And so the friend said, Oh, I don't, I can't believe this, that you're, you're acting this way. You know, I thought you were so much stronger. So control expectations. I did have a friend that was like that. That was kind of crazy. Right. So Anyway, she kind of breaks it down. Now, I lived with a person that was outsourcing responsibility. So my mother was a big time, oh, I don't want you saying hi to her at the, at the, the circuit assembly. Or, oh, I, I don't, I, with, for my father, she, he wasn't allowed to smile at certain people because it offended my mother. So yeah, uh, what else? She had a lot of things that she wasn't, you know, she didn't, when we would have dinner or whatever, and I had friends that did this too. Oh, well, I can't eat this and I can't eat that and you shouldn't either and this is bad for you. Yeah, uh, who uh, rules about what I can say and others, how sensitive they are excessive offended easily yeah so my mother was always easily offended and then we have to try and figure out well okay exactly what did I say or do yeah I don't I don't have it, that problem but I do have the the silent treatment and I just it's because I don't want to say something that would hurt anyone so usually I have to run or take a walk and I generally tell them, look, I am upset and I need to get some steam off and let it out. I need to walk. And it'll, it doesn't even matter what time of the day, like it can be in the evening, right? And I, we have had a very heated discussion, all four of us, and I'm going to be the target. <laughs> for whatever reason. And you know, then I have to say, I'm sorry or change my behavior. And that's hard for me because I never saw that. I never saw anyone in my family actually mean it, say they're sorry and actually mean it. And so, you know, you can say you're sorry, but if you're really doing it again, it doesn't matter. So yeah, changing my behavior uh, is tough because it's so ingrained to do the the thing that is the easiest instead of in instead of working on something that is difficult for me I do explain to them all of them look we can't have heated discussions to the point where we're all yelling at each other or screaming at each other because that's not getting us anywhere so we all take breaks and then, because the girls are getting old enough to have an, ex, you know, express, like I said, their opinions. So, and it's important for us to be stable enough to hear them. And so my husband generally is the stable one and I'm the more emotional one that says, oh no, you can't wear that. Are you, no, you know, you're not covered. Or, you know, what are you, what well, mom, you know, then they explain certain things, but it's hard. It's hard. And girls especially because you 
feel an enormous amount of protect. You want to protect them. You don't want them, you know, you don't want them to get hurt and there's nothing we can do. The outside world has learned a lot of bad behavior. And unfortunately, our, the girls are, you know, affected by that behavior. So it's not necessarily the girls that need to change, but it's the the dynamic of the, of the world around us. So yeah, hard. Oh, there are those two who are hard to love. <laughs> Sometimes people who need love the most deserve the least. So I had a mom that was really hard to love. And there were boundaries that I didn't even know how to put up with, with her. I didn't know how. So practicing them were, was hard. I didn't even, I couldn't even practice. She was the kind of person that she just rolled right over me. It was nothing I could do. It was really hard for me. I, my whole life was about my mother and taking care of her and protecting her and making sure she was safe. And after a while, it just got so exhausting. And my mother was the one that was most burdensome to my, in my, any of my relationships. Did I have burdensome friends? I don't have them now. And that feels really good. I, I didn't have many friends. I chose my friends wisely. In my cult, I chose my friends wisely. And they were usually distant, so we never really had a whole lot to, to do with each other on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they did know way too much about other people's lives. But because my husband was an apostate, or you know, was not a, an act of Jehovah's Witness, I really had very limited friends and that was fine. Smother love is not a good friend or a parent. Yeah, so learning how not to smother my children, allowing them to foster their own independent thinking and being okay with it, right? I don't think I have any friends right now that are exhausting. I have good friends right now that are really helpful and they listen and I don't have any controlling friends. I had a, I had a friend that was in my cult and, and she was really, she was bizarre. She was tough. I, I had a couple of those and I kind of made a lot of allowances for their behavior. But one friend in particular, I was having a hard time. I had just been diagnosed with my blood bleed. And she said that, I was just explaining some of the things that I, that was, that was happening to me. And <clears throat> it, you know, taking time, she was taking her time to listen. And then all of a sudden, uh, she just went off. And she said, your husband is making you sick and you need to leave him. And it, it's funny because, um, well, the problem that I had, it, it's only in 1% of the population. And they, it, some people can walk around with the same problem that I have and they would never know it. So it's just amazing how our brains work. Anyway, it was interesting because she has quietly kept so much from people about her husband. And I, you know, I look back now I mean, and I think, okay, that was kind of, that was something she was reflecting about herself, not about me, because that came out of nowhere. I couldn't understand why she was saying that. I mean, if anything, my husband was being super supportive in the situation. And I was having a bit of a breakdown because I was sick and trying to figure out how, you know, what was happening? Why was I sick? And 
you know, I think to some extent there was some truth to her, her, it, there was some truth to what she was saying, but it wasn't about leaving my husband. It was about leaving an organization or a cult. And it, it's sad because she has knowledge of, of therapy. She was trying to be a coach and she was a, a sister in, or what they, we call a sister in our cult. A person, regular pioneer. She had been regular pioneering. Her husband was an elder. I mean, I thought I was going to someone that would have been a source of encouragement. And yet that's not what I was getting at all. And it, and for a coach to say something like that, or for someone who had been a seasoned person in the cult that I was in, I guess I really shouldn't have expected anything less, right? I look at how harsh that they have, have become to people who need some guidance. So I really shouldn't have expected anything less. Now, looking back, I can see where my folly was, really. So, it's, yeah, don't expect to get a whole lot of support when you're not feeling well, mentally or emotionally or physically, in my cult. And for my cult, it was Jehovah's Witnesses. And I pair a lot of my knowledge about my cult with this 12 step program along with everything else that I've been through. I've had controlling individuals in my life. I've had a father that was an alcoholic. I've had a mother who had multiple problems um, emotionally and, and physically. And that let, I, I truly believe that her physical problems came because of her emotional problems. And she had a lot of anger, a lot of shame, and so it affected her life and it affected ours as well, her children. So controlling behaviors, I think that will always be something I will have to work on, right? There are things that reminders so that you don't go back to places that are dangerous for your mind or your body, for your family. Understanding understanding controlling behaviors understanding understanding codependency right understanding codependency and trying to see where you will always be something that you'll always have to work on right and investing in good healthy friendships i think that's probably the hardest part of uh codependency is making sure you're a good friend and then investing in other friendships. I find that um, investing in friendships can be very emotionally dra draining. So, you know, I what I put into it, um, I, I like to see the energy that is invested in my friendships is, you know, is equal. That, that we find more energy in the friendship than without each other. So yeah, it's, it's always, it's always going to be, I think a bit of a challenge for me to have a lot of friends. I don't think I will ever have a lot of friends. I've never have. I've had a few. I can count them on my hands and one, and that's all I'm, I'm happy with. I'm happy with the, the friends that I have. I have my best friend I married. And yeah, that's a lot of work. You know, it doesn't, it's not easy to be in a marriage. Uh, you have your ups and your downs and your harmony and your disharmony and your harmony again. So yeah, and it's been rough. I mean, it hasn't been easy. In the years that I decided to stay in my cult, I had a death grip. So it was tough. Okay, well, hopefully... Hopefully this helps you. I'll put my crappy childhood fairy, her two videos down below at the description. I really like her. She's really been, she, I, like I say, I go through, I go through my videos and I, some of them I love, love, love. And I have my podcasts, which I hope to share with you soon. And then also 
Oh, yeah. Books, you know, books are helpful. And I do believe that you can, you can get better. I do believe with people being honest and the time that they take to, to make sure that what, what, it, what we've gone through, right, is in the public domain, that we don't waste our experiences, our experiences, that we don't waste our experiences, that we're willing to share them with you so that you can see things. There's so many things that I always want to say. And sometimes if I don't write it down, I forget. But I think this is a great way to share. So I hope that you found that this, this helpful. I hope that you found this helpful. And there's so many wonderful ways to share. Um, I hope this is going to help you on your healing journey. Follow your bliss and be good humans. Thank you.